give you an introduction just now. I'm recording. Welcome everybody to this Friday's lunchtime lecture. We've got Steve Previk from Rhodes University with us today to talk about um, geochemical variation in mafic igneous rocks and how to, how to put constraints on that. Uh, Steve was trained in Canada. He's, uh, I think, still a Canadian citizen. Yep. He did his BSc honors and MSc at McMaster's in Hamilton, Ontario, and did his PhD at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. He specialized in the acquisition and application of radiogenic isotope data, along with the geochemistry and petrology, to the study of the origins and evolutions of various Proterozoic mafic intrusions. He has set up and maintained or worked in isotope labs in Ottawa, Montreal, and Sudbury while completing his PhD. He then moved to the University of Vavadarsran, where he spent six years in the isotope facilities, the Hugh Alsop Laboratory of what was then called what was then the Bernard Price Institute of Geophysical Research. He has been a member of the academic staff in geology at Rhodes University since 2004, where he teaches and conducts research in high temperature magmatic processes, mainly to do with layered mafic intrusions. And he has served as department head off and on. I, I think he may be the department head at the moment, but I'm not sure about that. Um, no. Steve, with that, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Craig. And welcome, everyone. So my uh, original theme here of constraining geochemical variation in mafic igneous rocks has been uh, kind of condensed. <laughs> I realized the, it was a, a talk that I had prepared for my postgraduate students last year. I can sit here for a Sorry, we've got someone we've got someone with an unmuted mic. Can you please mute yourself? Uh, Craig, can you mute them perhaps? Sorry, Steve, I'm trying to. No worries. Okay, so this, this was part of a talk that I prepared originally for my postgraduate students to sort of try to give them some simplification or constraints on what kind of process can cause the geochemistry of their uh, mafic magmatic rocks to change. And I realized, first of all, once I realized this was a half hour talk, that there was no way I was fitting all that into the, the talk. So... I started breaking it down into sections, and by the time I'm done with it, I realized that we're really just going to be talking about kind of identifying when you are dealing with um, certain effects. So this version of the talk, we will be looking at um, distinguishing the imp the effects of magma mixing and mingling and what those two processes are, how we can tell them apart and why it matters. Um, so we'll try to stick to the kind of half an hour lunchtime time slot. So there'll be a little bit of kind of textbook level teaching at the beginning, which hopefully won't be too patronizing and then we'll move straight on into a little bit more observations from real data sets. So the type of process that can induce changes in the chemical composition of magmas, kind of going from the beginning to the end and high temperature to low temperature would include these five stages or uh, settings. So magma mixing, then crustal contamination, which is gonna be happening at the same time as differentiation and crystallization and fractional crystallization where we start removing the crystals from the magma. And then the late magmatic processes where we start separating crystals from the liquids and um, extracting the liquid from the crystals and um, subsolidus processes. And then finally, the lower temperature um, alteration processes. So we'll quickly identify what we, how I define each of these uh, settings. Um, so how we tell them apart, what criteria I'm using. And then um, we'll be really dealing with the first one mainly in today's talk. <clears throat> 
So magma mixing means we are mixing two compositionally distinct components. And I've specified that this is itself not as straightforward as you might think, because if, if most mantle partial melts, for example, a lot of the geochemical components won't really be distinguishable from one another. But as long as some of the parameters are different, then it has some effect on our mixture, our byproduct. The key feature of magma mixing, as distinct from con crustal contamination, is that the magmatic components are all at around the same temperature. So it means we can mix them together without energy constraints being a limitation on the proportions of mixing. By contrast, crustal contamination, we are where we are still ultimately assimilating partial melts from more than one source, fundamentally still magma mixing. So with crustal contamination, implication is that the crustal partial melt is induced by contact with the mantle partial melt. So it's heating up the crustal rocks, creating a partial melt, um, some components of which are diffusing in or coming in as a liquid into the mantle melt. So this is significantly constrained by the energy factors involved. We are using up heat energy from the mafic magma to produce a partial melt of the crust, which can contaminate it. So in contrast to magma mixing, um, where it's mantle partial melts, um, this is quite a different story than, and the amount of contribution from the crust is significantly less. Okay, then we have the effects of differentiation or fractional crystallization together. So essentially where we are um, spatially separating different phases, so specifically solids and liquids, um, there are a lot of different um, components to this potentially. So it's not just one set of solids and one set of liquids that can be involved. Um, so these can be quite complex multi-component systems. And I would categorize late magmatic compaction driven extraction of interesting liquids in this category as well. And then lastly, we have alteration processes, um, which include any subsolidus recrystallization process. And many of these are still significant high temperature processes where the magma has just left the system and by some interpretation significant um, pro well what we think of as primary magmatic features such as um, fine scale layering can be produced by these processes and then there's the more traditional so-called deuteric type processes where it's probably late magmatic water causing alteration to primary magmatic minerals we're not going to get to that today anyway. So magma mixing, again, means we are mixing two high temperature melts, which means we have effectively no energy budget constraints on our mixing. So we can produce high percentage mixtures of either component. We we'll assume we're talking about two end members, although we're in theory not limited to that. So magma mixing, where are we likely to find it? The mantle is the first place it's likely to occur. So we're talking about source processes. So we can modify our mantle partial melts before they get out of the mantle. We have a bunch of different possible reservoirs to play with, including the convecting asthenospheric mantle, the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, so the non-convecting -con component, and then potentially the lower undepleted mantle, which may be contributing materials which can be melted, probably in the case of plumes, and it's not rising as a melt, but it can still experience decompression melting later. So we can melt the same materials in different ways, which will produce 
different types of partial melt product from them. For example, the asthenospheric mantle can be melted by decompression melting, as we see at mid-ocean ridges, for example. Um, and we'll have a quick look at examples of this, at least in geochemical plots. And then we can have melting of asthenosphere induced by heating from mantle plume and placement into the upper asthenosphere. And depending on where you are relative to the mantle plume, there are different thermal domains which will have different um, partial melting outcomes. Some have suggested, for example, that kimberlite and carbonatite magmas are related to um, proximity to the plume source, inducing different degrees of partial melting and different characteristics of the resultant partial melts. So here's a couple of slides just using um, images from Winter's textbook. So for example, in the asthenospheric mantle, we have um, for the last 40 years been identifying different upper mantle reservoirs based on their radiogenic isotopic characteristics. So these are the fairly traditional diagrams using neodymium and strontium radiogenic isotopes. Um, and adding lead to that picture, we can define a wide range of potential isotopic end members contributing to the melts are produced or we recognize in ocean islands, for example. So we know that there is a relatively heterogeneous assortment of isotopic reservoirs in the upper mantle. A relatively simple illustration of this comes from mid-ocean ridges where normal mid-ocean ridge basalts which are the products of decompression melting, are found to be mixed with enriched mid-ocean ridge basalts, which come from deeper partial melts. And these then mix and produce a transitional mid-ocean ridge basalt with a distinct geochemistry. So these are relatively subtle distinctions. Um, but here we have an example where melts produced by different processes at different depths in the same system um, eventually leave us with multiple source materials from which erupted magmas um, can represent them. When we add plumes to the story, there's the possibility of decompression melting in the, of the plume itself combined with heating of the asthenosphere and partially melting it, and then when the plume interacts with the base of the lithosphere, we get partial melting of the subcontinental mantle there. And the result is we get an assortment of melts produced here, including carbonatites and kimberlites. So we can show these kinds of generalized images of a variety of different mantle reservoirs um, of which one can debate where they might be or how they might be contributing in a given tectonic setting depending on what kind of uh, or the, the location of the layered intrusion of interest to you in your particular study. So we will leave the mantle behind here. So the, the, the types of variation we produce by mantle melting or mantle mixing in the mantle is still relatively subtle. Um, we're still kind of producing basalts or basaltic magmas from this um, without getting too extreme in compositions normally, where we can veer into andesites and things in modest volumes. So in the crust is where we're more interested. So now we can have magma pulses interacting with um, residual liquids from previous pulses of the same magma. We can also get magmas inter interacting with potentially different sourced magmas at depth. But that's probably relatively uncommon. So we can see this kind of thing in layered intrusions. And people like Ian Campbell have um, suggested different styles of interaction of the new magma pulses depending on density contrasts, which we'll have a quick look at in a second. And then in the sort of plumbing system, in the sills and dikes, which may lead to layered intrusions, we also have evidence for polyphase emplacement 
preserved in the geochemistry and the textual evidence in some cases, which we'll have a look at now now. So Campbell conducted experimental studies using fluid analogs for magma, which he then reproduced as these kind of well-known diagrams. Um, this is from the Campbell, Naldrit, and Steve Barnes paper in 1983, where we see the potential, depending on the buoyancy contrast of the incoming melt, as shown in the picture in the bottom right. So where we have pluming of the incoming melt into the magma chamber in the upper crust. So the incoming magma then um, ascends, interacts turbulently with the residual magma in the magma chamber, and then settles down onto the transient floor defined by the cumulate pile below it. So probably the host liquid, the upper part of this chamber is also going to be containing quite a lot of phenocrysts that haven't yet settled or are neutral buoyant, neutrally buoyant. Um, so it's less, probably less dramatic a contrast between the crystal pile at the floor and the residual liquid. But the key point here is the turbulent zone in which a hybrid liquid produced by magma mixing is generated. And this produces a new um, geochemical reservoir for us to play with. So in sills and dikes, we have evidence for different magmas interacting. These pictures are from the quartz diorite offset dikes at the Sudbury igneous complex. So not normal mantle partial melts, but a, probably an impact melt. Uh, where it's injected into the country rock, the picture on the left shows us um, an, what's generally believed to be an early high temperature uh, dike where there's relatively few inclusions and little mineralization uh, being intruded by a later class rich variant of the same composition. It's almost indistinguishable geochemically. So most people leave, believe there's a sort of a uh, time gap in between those two phases, but some workers believe that these are separated only by a few seconds and that they are intruding at almost the same time and temperature. And the gradational contacts between the two phases shown on the right is used as evidence in support of that model. What's described in the field as sharply gradational, where you can still put your finger on the contact, but it is still a gradational contact. Um, work done over the last decade or so by Rice Letipov and Sofia Kistyakova um, showed cases where the geochemical trends and specifically what they described as their anomalous compositional trend here, where um, the geochemical variation from the core to the rim of an intrusive sill of um, dolerytic rocks is inconsistent with a change from a primitive to an evolved composition. So they interpreted this as evidence that a different source of magma was being accessed over time as the magma was being intruded. And so it wasn't just a progressively evolving magma. It must have been um, changing composition um, over time, but without any textural discontinuity being represented. And this is over a relatively small spatial scale as well. So the term magma mingling is often used sort of synonymously with magma mixing. You often see it in papers where um, people write magma mingling slash mixing. So this is unhelpful. These are two separate processes. Um, magma mingling implies that the two magmas are staying as separate physical phases or entities. So they are behaving as though they are immiscible, at least temporarily. Um, true immiscibility historically has been treated as kind of a, a marginal uh, condition in normal magmas and a kind of freak 
circumstance that we don't really need to worry about. And typically, it's only in cases where the magmas are unusually enriched in iron, titanium, and phosphorus um, relative to normal basaltic systems that we might expect to see um, truly emissible behavior. It has been suggested by some workers that the same magma at different temperatures can be very restricted in its physical ability to mix, that the, the kinetics of mixing are inhibited by the viscosity change from small temperature differences, so they don't really mix efficiently. However, I have been recently unable to track down my source for this information, but I know somebody said it. If anybody um, actually has information on this, maybe you can uh, text in a comment about that. So it's been suggested that the magma mixing process that we um, attribute the origins of chromatite layers, which we'll talk about in a minute, to may not be as practical as has previously or as traditionally been thought, if this is really a factor. But the reading I've been doing lately, where even very felsic melts, where there's a big viscosity contrast with mafic melts, suggests that um, homogenization in these environments is probably quite practical. So here's a couple of examples of emissible, proper emissible behavior. Um, the picture on the top left is from the Duluth complex um, at the base of the complex, and this is in the mid-continent rift in the north, in the central United States on the northwest shore of Lake Superior. So there's cyanitic rocks interacting with the fundamentally basaltic magmas of the Duluth complex. That's the arm of Falcon Bridge employee Mike Sweeney holding a beer for scale. Um, the picture at the bottom is from granitic footwall rocks, which have become partially melted by emplacement of mafic magmas at the Wanapate complex, which is just to the southeast of Sudbury. So that's the traditional interpretation is that the, the gabbro has actually caused the partial melting of the granite. This is probably unlikely based on heat budget considerations, um, but you can actually walk in from the granite footwall along um, sort of thick dikes of granitic material, which as you walk into the, the Garbernorite, they become more and more um, diffuse and more and more um, homogenized with the mafic rocks. So another place where immiscibility proper has been proposed as being a key um, petrogenetic process is in the origins of um, magnetite layers and specifically the thick magnetites in southwestern China in the Panjihua and Panxi magmatic suites. So Mei Fu Zhu has suggested two different immiscibility stages, one in which the cyanitic rocks are separated from the ferragabroic rocks or gabroic rocks. And then later, after some crystallization and evolution, that the silicate phase of the ferragabros separates from the iron oxides, which then sort of self intrude as tens of meter thick units of mostly magnetite with some trapped um, immiscible silicate materials. So the, the pictures at the top of this diagram um, from the PhD work of Jeff Howarth show what could be interpreted either as corroded silicate minerals in disequilibrium with the um, iron-rich melt, immiscible melt, or they are trapped silicate liquid. So the immiscible people would interpret these as just trapped silicate liquid, which has eventually crystallized as plagioclase and clinopyroxene in these examples. And there's little reaction rims on the the margins, which suggests that these are not in equilibrium with one another. Um, Disequilibrium or immiscibility has been suggested for the Bushveld itself as well, relatively recently. Here's work by Fisher et al. from 2016. And here's Ilya Vexler's example from experimental studies 
showing us an iron rich glass yeah, and a silica rich yeah. glass preserved in um, the, exper the uh, experimental charge here. So we'll move on from proper emissibility, uh, just mentioning as we leave that we can also get uh, carbonate liquids. So obviously we have carbonatite magmatic liquids um, associated with kimberlites and that's a kind of transitional um, suite. But in terms of layered mafic intrusions, we can actually get immiscible carbonate liquids being produced by partial melting of carbonate footwall, as is shown in this work by Brooker and Kjarsgaard. So how do we identify whether magma mixing or mag magma mingling is actually present in the rocks? We would expect that um, immiscible liquids at high temperatures, at least if we preserve that, should be manifested as um, blobs of one rock type within another. When you look at the literature, we are mostly looking at the lower temperature manifestations of this, where the actual magmatic liquids aren't necessarily preserved, but um, xenocrysts of, from one magma are preserved within the other magma, and they are now in disequilibrium because they didn't crystallize from that magma. So we can look at a couple of examples here. So the picture on the left shows, this is again from Sudbury, from the offset dikes where we see rounded blebs of the relatively inclusion free. Um, so these are little gray ovals hosted in a sulfide rich inclusion bearing quartz diorite. So these have been interpreted by some workers as xenoliths of the original quartz dye, which had been torn off and then rounded by transport, but they could e equally be representing potential immiscible liquid interactions. And the picture on the right shows us quartz grains um, hosted in the quartz diorite. So these are superheated impact melts. So they are thought to be in the neighborhood of 16, 17, 1800 degrees Celsius. And these are titanium rims on the quartz, which is thought to be a thermal response to being incorporated. It's believed that these xenocrysts, though, are actually from the country rock and not from another magma. So these are probably not evidence for magma mingling, but it's the type of texture one would be looking for. Now, from the Bushfell complex, here are some examples of rounded grains of plagioclase feldspar trapped in orthopyroxenes. On the left and on the right, we have rounded crystals of orthopyroxene hosted within late interstitial clinopyroxene. These can both be interpreted as evidence of um, resorption. So where early crystals are reacting with a melt which they are not in equilibrium with, and this could be evidence of magma mixing. And this is supported, at least to some degree, by the mineral compositional evidence, suggesting that the rims are more calcic than the cores, although it's not distinctly within the, the resolution of the averages of the probe data here. Um, but the implication then, one interpretation of that would be that the plagioclase began to crystallize and then found itself hosted in a magma of, that was either hotter and or of a different composition, which caused the rims to um, become more calcic rather than if it was normal crystallization, they should become progressively more sodic. Um, here are some other examples from the Chinese ferrogabroic layered intrusions where early plagioclase um, exists as rounded phenocrysts within olivine grains in this case. Um, here's a couple of textural examples which appear to be disequilibrium, but are in fact probably not. In this example, there's an orthopyroxene grain in Bushveld um, footwall rocks, Marinsky Reef footwall rocks, um, where there's a clinopyroxene rim around the orthopyroxene where it is in contact with um, mostly with plagioclase. However, we don't believe this is any kind of reaction rim. Partly it's discontinuous, the clinopyroxene, 
it seems to be at the boundary of the orthopyric scene, whether it's in contact with plagioclase or with other orthopyric scenes, which isn't really consistent with a reaction rim. There's no expected reaction between those phases which should produce this. So we believe that what we're actually seeing here is exolution lamellae from within the orthopyric scene, which because this grain has been suspended at high temperatures for a long time, diffusion has allowed that material to migrate to the grain boundaries and collect there. And this is supported by the probe data, which indicates that the exolution lamellae, where they are preserved, have the same composition as these clinopyroxene rims and are much more primitive, though, than the oikocrystic interstitial clinopyroxene found elsewhere in the same rocks. So if we plot that on the clinopyroxene compositional diagram, um, this is consistent with sort of early crystallized clinopyroxene moving by diffusion and distinct from late crystallized interstitial clinopyroxene. Um, and these kinds of mineral reaction textures are also probably not evidence for disequilibrium. The picture on the left, these are from um, a layered gabronorite from Eastern Labrador in Canada in the, in the mid Proterozoic. And in this case, we see optically continuous orthopyric scenes surrounding olivine grains. So these are consistent with peritectic reactions of olivine with um, paratectic liquid from which orthopyroxene is being produced as part of normal equilibrium magmatic crystallization. In the same rocks, we also have coronitic reaction between early formed olivines and later liquids, which are now represented by plagioclase. And these have produced these double coronas of orthopyroxene and symplectic Pargasitic amphibole and spinel. And these are. Steve, sorry, largely... but um, I think we, we're not seeing the microphotographs. Oh. Um, what are you seeing? We're seeing the, the wager and brown ternary diagram. Oh. Hang on. I have moved to the next slide. So. Oh, my screen's sharing is paused. It says, hang on. Let's see about that. Kind of. I'm not sure how to fix this one. We haven't run into this before. I think that I was advanced. Let's see. Let's resume share. Oh, there we are. Hang on. Now it's gone back to the beginning. Doink. Are we there now? We're there now. You just need to put it in presentation mode. How about now? Now that takes us back to the ternary diagram. There we go. Okay. There's a bit of a time delay here. Okay. So the picture on the left is showing these instatitic rims. So they they are all optically continuous. If I rotate the slide, they would all go extinct at the same time. Whereas the orthopyric scenes, which are the white layer making the central triangle on the right-hand diagram, they are radial and they're growing in from the original contact between the olivine, which is com almost completely consumed there. Those few little crystals in the center surrounded by serpentine are the only remnants of that olivine. So that's believed to be a subsolidus process um, and is not a magma mixing phenomenon. So why do we care? What's the difference between mingling and mixing ultimately? Magma mingling is believed to not produce um, a hybrid magma composition. Whereas if we can get it to mix and generate a new magma, this can be saturated in elements which are not 
saturated in either of the two parent magmas. So it has unique characteristics which are different from either of the parents, such as um, saturation in chrome, as Irvine proposed in the 1970s, and saturation in sulfur, as Naldert and Gerhard von Gronefeld proposed a decade later. So we'll have a quick look at those. I know we're probably out of my half hour already. So the well-known Irvine magma mixing model involving the mixture of residual magmas, which would have a composition at point G with newly intruded magma pulses somewhere between B and C, produce a magma, um, the new hybrid magma composition at D, which is then in the field of chrome only crystallization or chromite only crystallization. And that then crystallizes a layer of chromite. And then the magma then proceeds along cotectic crystallization again after that. So the hybrid magma has characteristics which neither of its parents have. Um, and this model has been used to identify, to, um, it's, the, it's still the prevalent model for chromatite layers in general, um, particularly in cases such as we see here at um, the upper critical zone where um, a relatively leukocratic magma, in this case an, an orthocytic layer, is underlying the chromatite. So the implication being a kind of noritic magma has mixed with an anorthocytic magma. So there's a compositional difference between the two resulting in a chromatite, depending on how you believe those anorthocytic magmas or rocks have formed. It's less obvious how this kind of mechanism can produce chromatite layers where there is no compositional contrast between the foot wall and the hanging wall, as we see from the lower critical zone, for example. So in order to use this same kind of model to explain the association of chromatites and sulfides, often PGE bearing, um, sorry, I've lost a picture there. In fact, I've lost a bunch of pictures, mysteriously. Hang on. We've lost the photos that go with that. So this was the same von Hohenfeldt plot. Um, showing magma mixing. Um, what was meant to be shown here I don't think I'm going to be able to bring it back and we're about out of time, is that the same kind of model has been applied for mixing early pulses and late pulses of magma um, to produce sulfur saturation, magmatic sulfides, although Grant Cawthorn has then shown by refining that plot that mixing the residual magma with a new pulse of the same magma actually doesn't produce a sulfur saturated byproduct. So the nice elegant magma mixing model where you don't need a new source for the magma doesn't actually work um, conveniently to explain sulfur saturation. In the second part of these talks, which we won't really get into today, um, the different process or the complementary process where we have to heat up the contaminant in order to produce then magma mixing then requires or involves significant constraints based on the amount of available energy in the system. And it generates a multi-component system where we have not only a magma and a contaminant, but also the production of crystals or cumulates which typically are very low in incompatible element abundances. So they have a significant effect on the, the mixing behavior. The other kind of um, factors we can see with crustal contamination are the effect on 
silicate mineral stabilities. Um, normally, we attribute silicate crust, so granitic upper crustal material contaminating a mafic magma to result in the production of norites, so producing orthopyroxene in otherwise olivine clinopyroxene basaltic or gabroic type rocks. It's possible that the effect of carbonate contamination could actually produce olivine in um, the magmatic rocks as a result of contamination, which goes against the normal behavior where we always move from olivine bearing rocks to orthopyroxene bearing rocks. Um, the effect of assimilating wet materials or simply assimilating materials using up energy and crystallizing dry minerals, which has then the effect of um, increasing the water content of the magma, not necessarily to the point where we will crystallize wet minerals, can also be that we um, change the phase boundaries of the dominant mineral, dry mineral assemblage, and we can also induce the crystallization of olivine where it wasn't previously stable. And this kind of mechanism has been proposed as an explanation for the reappearance of olivine in the Marinsky Reef, for example, when in the stratigraphy, it had disappeared a long time before that. And then lastly, um, one of the key features is uh, the ability to distinguish between the effects of crustal contamination and fractional crystallization. They are both going to tend to produce silica and alkali rich um, or enrichments in our affected rocks, but not in the same geochemical directions. So superficially, these effects will look very similar. But in details, we can distinguish between the effects in any given case of crustal contamination and accumulation of crystals for the production of cumulates and the resultant enrichment in the residual liquids. And I think that's where I'm going to stop since I'm well over time. And sorry about the missing slides. So thank you. Thank you, Steve, for a very well illustrated talk. Um, I'll open the floor to questions and comment. Um, you have a, uh, you can raise your hand or just unmute your mic and, and fire away. Do we have any questions or comments? I see nothing at the moment. See um, one. Steve, just one general comment, maybe a query from me. Um, there are some really very nice photographs of textures in rocks. And um, it struck me that petrography, petrographic evidence can often be interpreted in a number of ways. And is it is it fair to say that as, as you get deeper and deeper into this, the, the, the theory of magma mixing and, and mingling that um, that becomes more and more complicated? Is that, is, is, is that a fair statement to make? I, I think that's hard to argue with. I think, um, I think we're, everybody's, we're all very clever at rationalizing what we see with what, how we want to interpret it. Um, but I think that's the basis for, uh, um, ultimate and, and then combining that with experimental and theoretical data to support it. Um, I think it is, it's important that we don't just uh, um, dismiss field evidence of, of, of which petrography is essentially an extension of, but it's true that um, in the field, for example, relationships where one rock type appears to be cross-cutting another one, you can find elsewhere evidence for the exact opposite relationship. So then how you interpret that becomes um, kind of arbitrary and it's easy to then just say, well, we're just going to ignore that and use the geochemistry or something. But I think ultimately, if kind of isotopic or geochemical explanations don't make sense with fundamental field relationship type data, then workers in the field and particularly mine geologists, I'll, we'll, they'll thank you very much for your extremely cunning interpretation, 
but if it doesn't doesn't really fit with what they see they're not going to take that on board or and use it so i think it's important that the physical evidence is made to reconcile with the geochemical evidence Okay, thank you for that. We have another question. Uh, uh, Bruce, Ren Bruce has a hand up. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Ren. I'm tuning in from the east coast of Canada. Hi, Steve. Um, thank you for the Hi. talk. I just wanted to ask um, a quick question. You showed a photo of um, in the Bushveld, the lower critical, comp uh, lower critical zone, and you were saying that the chromite layer, there's some, sometimes it's indistinguishable, or the, the composition is indistinguishable, so they're Therefore, the chromite layer is inexplicable. Could you go over that again, please? Okay. So, yeah, so the picture is here. Um, the Irvine, I'm not saying it's inexplicable, but the okay. Irvine, <laughs> the magma mixing model, so the Irvine's original 1977 version, the idea is that um, a, if we go then back to this preceding slide, possibly, um, that the, the residual um, liquid from a, a crystallizing pulse of magma in the magma chamber will end up with a relatively evolved composition somewhere around point G on this diagram. And then when you inject a new pulse of relatively primitive magma that has not yet started crystallizing much, um, when it mixes with the residual pulse, it'll produce a hybrid which is lying in the field of chromite only saturation. So Irvine does go through a bunch of different examples where depending on the degree of mixing, so how close we are say to point C versus to point G, if we were for example to mix sort of 80% residual melt with 20% new pulse, we'd be sitting at a point much higher on this mixing line, this dotted line here. And we could potentially then have an orthoperoxenite underneath and overlying the chromatite layer. But we should still see some change in the mineral chemistry or some evidence that we have mixed compositionally different magmas. And Many workers have been looking at, say, the UG2 in the upper critical zone, and the orthopyroxene compositions below and above the chromatite layers seem to be completely indistinguishable. So the implication is that that chromatite layer um, is hosted by rocks which are no different chemically. So it's then hard to see how a, a magma mixing model could explain the formation of that chromatite. So then we start um, resorting to other models or they start becoming more attractive, such as pressure change models or um, injected lateral slurry models. And these models have their own sets of problems, but they then start looking like more appealing alternatives to a magma mixing model if we can't actually see any evidence for magma heterogeneity represented in the rocks now. Oh, I see. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Yes. Steve, I don't see. Oh, there's someone? Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for, for, this, for this talk. I have a, a sure. question regarding the, the immiscible ion data and enrichment. Yeah. I mean, now, I mean, we, there's a lack of experimental uh, data to support the formation of such kinds mm -hmm. such kind of, of, of melts. But yeah. on the other hand, we have um, evidences from the fieldwork that might uh, somehow uh, take us to, this, to, to, to such uh, models of uh, immiscibility. Uh, I would like to know what's, what's your personal uh, observation regarding to such a uh, problem. Yeah, I think that's always been the, the the issue with iron rich melts that we have decent theoretical um, support for the existence in normal magmatic systems of iron rich liquids so we don't need to be massively superheated to get them 
So yes, the question is, why don't we see this more often? As far as I know, uh, th this is really the, so either we're not recognizing it, so it, it is more common than we think, but we don't recognize it. And the people that are proposing this as a, a model for um, magnetite layers in the Bushveld and in the, the Chinese Permian intrusions, um, they would then be arguing that this is a relatively common process, but it doesn't apply to the chromatite layers in sometimes in the same intrusions because chromatite would require a spectacularly hot um, and unrealistically hot um, magma to actually produce an immiscible chromatite liquid. So the fact that they're texturally very, very similar is a problem. But the one example that I know of where people, or that these at least more widespread agreement that it could be an iron rich immiscible liquid is a, an, a volcanic eruption in Mexico, which is believed to um, be a, um, yeah, I think it's sort of mag magnetite hematite um, eruptive magma. So that's been the sort of one case where people think maybe that's actual evidence for an erupted immiscible iron rich liquid. Although the, there's also the alternative interpretation that it's a kind of super gene um, leaching, which has left us with this because it's a relatively highly um, oxidized secondary setting as well. So there's, there's controversy there too. So yeah, so I think it's a question of deciding what constitutes acceptable criteria for this. But I do think it is a bit tricky to have identical, texturally identical layers virtually in the same intrusion where we want um, dramatically different genetic models for the two. So the comparison of chromatites and magnetotites, um, I think probably we need to do, do more direct comparisons of those two and really try to identify um, textural features which um, distinguish them before people will start taking the immiscibility model seriously. Well, thank you very much, Professor. By the way, this is David from Japan. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, David, for that. Um, uh, one last comment or question. I, going once, going twice. I guess we have no more comments or questions. Steve, I'd like to thank you very much for doing this today. Um, I mean, what came home from, for me was the, the complexity of this stuff. And I'll talk to you about kimberlites and carbonatites another day. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for this. It was a very well il illustrated talk. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors for July uh, for these series of lect uh, lockdown lectures that we'll host in July. And that is Terracore Geospectral Imaging. So thank you very much for uh, allowing us, to, for supporting us to do these lectures. Uh, with that, I'll end the meeting. Um, so thank you all for attending. Uh, we have uh, another series on next week. Uh, please check your calendars. Thank you very much. I'll end the meeting now. Okay, thanks a lot, Craig. You can email me my bottle of wine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers all. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.